Okay, welcome back from the break. Um, we have still many things to do this afternoon and to listen to. And we've come, but we've come to the last lecture in the epigenetic, uh, on the epigenetic theme. And I'm really happy to introduce Professor Patrick McGowan. He's Professor of Biological Science at the University of Toronto. And he will uh, give a lecture on epigenetic programming of the response to stress. Very welcome, Patrick, and I hope you are there. I can't see you, and I can't see you, hear you yet. So, um, thank you very much for the, uh, the, the introduction. I uh, apologize for, um, and I feel, I regret not being able to attend the, uh, the other talks except the last one. Um, I was uh, conducting, let's say, my own um, personal uh, study of uh, parenting behavior. Uh, and so, in my context, uh, the uh, because I'm on Eastern Standard Time and getting my kids to uh, to behave and get to school is one of my primary responsibilities in the early morning. So, yes, uh, paternal care is important. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my research program and um, provide an overview of some of our mechanistic studies that relate to the. Um, uh, to the impact of the early life environment and in particular environmental adversity on modifying epigenetic responses and uh, gene expression programs. So um, of course the development as we all understand is a time of enhanced vulnerability to environmental adversity and there are many different sources of this, uh, some of which are in the external environment and others of which are in the, the early, the, uh, the uh, maternal environment. And um, in the context of uh, the research that I've conducted, I'm primarily interested in several features of the maternal environment that impact the offspring, and in particular, the way that the offspring develops and um, responds to stressors um, throughout the lifespan. So I'm going to talk about a few, uh, par few aspects of this research in this regard in this talk. And really what um, the focal point of the, uh, the way that we conceive of our um, uh, of developmental plasticity in the early life is that, as I said, plasticity is, is highest in the early life and wanes throughout life. And uh, in contrast, environmental challenges can increase throughout life. But the role of plasticity has a profound effect in shaping the response to environmental challenges. And so when we conceive of the role of early life environment and adversity, we can think of this really as a journey throughout life. Um, so in terms of what I'll discuss today, I'm going to talk a bit about what it means uh, when we talk about developmental programming and early life adversity, uh, a little bit about epigenetic modifications that have been described uh, very well by previous speakers. Um, I'm going to talk about our work in prematurity uh, and the role of stress and uh, biological aging. I'll talk about our work in animal models of uh, programming of neurodevelopment by maternal care. And I'll end with a discussion of our work on maternal obesity as a developmental stressor. So maternal factors have a um, profound effect in shaping the offspring to use parental signals in early life to forecast the quality of the environment that they must face later in life. And this has uh, several consequences for how physiological and behavioral responses are coordinated uh, as a function of early life challenges. So some of these intersect well when we talk about using animal models to understand this at a mechanistic level. So and this has been studied in, in our lab and many others in the context of stress responses, the endocrine stress response and neural systems that support stress responses in terms of uh, growth and metabolism effects and uh, specific effects on neural development. And there are other um, aspects of early life uh, adversity that are harder to model in animals uh, completely, but we, we approximate the uh, those by studying behaviors in animals that um, tell us about their anxiety-like behaviors or depressive-like behaviors that might be a, a way of understanding uh, 
how these behaviors occur in, in, uh, in humans. So one of the underlying principles, of course, of, of this research is that the way that these responses are uh, programmed in a long-term manner is through the programming of gene expression. And so to understand how that occurs, we have to see the genome in context. And when we look at how the genome is uh, compacted into the cell and how it must be folded and um, maintained uh, to maintain access to transcription factors that regulate the, the expression of genes, we have to consider multiple levels of regulatory control, not just the gene sequence itself, of course, but the factors that are above the gene sequence that we call epigenetic. And these include modifications to histone proteins that around which the DNA is coiled and modifications to the DNA itself through DNA methylation that you've heard a lot about. Um, and one other way to, to think about this is really in the context of how the genome interacts with the epigenome is that the kind of gene by environment interactions are uh, manifest in the epigenetic profile of the individual. And the ways in which the epigenome modifications like DNA methylation, which is a modification to the DNA itself, can alter phenotype are largely established during development and they can modify gene expression. They don't always, um, but there are plenty of examples in which they do. And they may do so in some specific context at specific times and not others. And so it's very critical to understand that um, there is no direct correspondence one-to-one -one between levels of modifications of the epigenome and necessarily the expression of genes. And it may be that there are specific contexts in which the programming of DNA methylation or other epigenetic modifications can be um, shown to be involved in the process of gene expression, depending on the context in which the animal, including the human animal, finds itself in. So I'll talk a bit about stressors in this context and how they impinge on the epigenome. And one of the stressors we can consider is, is uh, poor diet as well. So let me start with a discussion of our work on prematurity, stress, and biological aging. Um, one of the uh, collaborative work that I've been, um, I've been pursuing with a group at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, is to look at some of the oldest surviving uh, individuals who were born sub 1000 grams. And so at this point, these, these, this cohort of individuals has been tracked for over 30 years. And so we're looking at adults and we're, we, we have access to buccal epithelial cells from adults to understand how their um, extreme prematurity ha had led, uh, led to a number of physiological and behavioral problems throughout their lives. So uh, we know that <clears throat> we know that prematurity involves, among other things, parental separation, such as cold stress or lack of parental care, a number of painful procedures in the NICU. And uh, some of these have been, have been shown to have profound consequences early in, in development as well. Um, so these individuals have been followed, as I said, to adulthood. And one of our questions was to look at what we call the epigenetic clock. So this has been touched on in the last talk. But the epigenetic clock involves a um, looking at DNA modifications throughout the genome. So there are 353 of them uh, spread across the genome. And uh, some of the early research into this uh, has looked at the correspondence between these epigenetic modifications and all causes of mortality. And actually, the correlation has, is quite predictive, and it occurs across many different tissue types, including buccal cells. And so it's not specific to specific tissue types. Um, and it is known to be um, modified by risk factors and protective factors that either accelerate the epigenetic clock or um, uh, slow it down. So one could look at, in this context, the difference between an epigenetic clock that's in an individual that hasn't had early life adversity versus one, uh, an individual that has, and to understand whether this clock is running faster. Essentially, um, the biological aging of this individual then is uh, predicted to be um, accelerated compared to in the context of an early life adverse exposure compared to an individual who doesn't have that uh, early life exposure. 
So when we did this in the context of extreme prematurity, again, we're looking at adults that were born extreme low birth weight, so less than 1,000 grams. What we found is that men in particular seem to be vulnerable to um, epigenetic aging. And in fact, male adults in their 30s that were born extreme low birth weight show accelerated epigenetic aging on the order of about four and a half years. So they were about four and a half years older than their chronological age compared to men born normal birth weight above 2,500 grams or women of either extreme low birth weight or normal birth weight. We also looked at their, um, the relationship between risk factors that are associated with uh, prematurity in this context. And so when we looked at uh, the cumulative effect of risk factors by looking at the resting respiratory sinus arrhythmia, diastolic blood pressure, cortisol levels, BMI, hand grip strength, and the cognitive measures of global self-esteem, we found that each risk factor cumulatively added two years to the epigenetic aging of um, age of uh, extreme low birth weight survivors. Um, so I want to turn to uh, the stress response system itself, which we've modeled in animals. And uh, just to provide a brief review of, of the endocrine stress response involves a cascade of hormones from the hypothalamus to the adrenal cortex that uh, lead to the release of cortisol or corticosterone in animals that then feed back up to the brain in a negative feedback inhibition manner that refines that response to stress um, through the actions on glucocorticoid receptors in areas of the brain that are stress sensitive, like the hippocampus and the amygdala. Um, and of course, glucocorticoids have profound effects, not just in the brain, but throughout the body on the immune system. And so we can uh, use, we can understand the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal response to stress by also looking at peripheral signals in blood. Um, so one thing I just wanted to point out is the location of glucocorticoid receptors that are responsive to corticosterone or cortisol um, that are highly expressed in areas of the brain that are stress sensitive, like the hippocampus and the amygdala. So in our lab, we've looked at a model of maternal care and in rodents, maternal care primarily uh, involves the um, licking and grooming of pups. And so I'll use that term to describe how maternal care happens in animals. Uh, when we looked within a litter of pups, so rats can have, you know, 12 to 18 pups at a time. So there's a lot of uh, animals potentially in a litter. When we looked at within the litter of pups, we saw that there was tremendous variation in the amount of care provided to each individual sibling within a litter by the same mom. And this was very consistent from early life all the way through to the end of the primary period of maternal licking and grooming uh, after day nine. So the pup that was leaked the lick, licked the most early on was also licked the most later on in the litter for reasons that we're only just starting to unravel or understand. But what we also note from this is that the pups in from moms that provide relatively low levels of licking overall provide about the same amount of licking to the highest lick pup in their litter as the moms that provide relatively high amounts of care overall provide to the lowest lick pup in their litter. So in terms of absolute licking amounts, there's, uh, there are pups within the litter that receive um, as much care as uh, pups in, from, in the low licking mom from um, in litters where the mom is uh, high licking dam. So when we looked at what the consequences were in adulthood of the differences in care provided, we found that um, this had consequences for the expression of glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus, which was higher in uh, the offspring of um, dams that provided relatively more care. And we found that this correlated with a reduction in the amount of circulating corticosterone, as would be expected, so a reduced stress response. We also found that there were differences that related to both the sibling uh, the amount of care that siblings received in the litter um, in terms of anxiety-like behaviors, so the amount of locomotor activity that the animals produced in, uh, in an open um, area. In that open area as well, the amount of time that the animals spend investigating the inner portion of or the center portion of the open field, which is a measure of anxiety, so animals who are more anxious tend to stay at the 
on the sides of the arena versus going out and exploring the center. We found that the animals who had received relatively higher care, higher levels of care showed um, less anxiety behavior and were more willing to venture out into the center of the open field. We also found that this correlated with differences in methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor at specific sites where some animals from high looking at, uh, dams showed higher levels of methylation at very specific select sites within the promoter of glucocorticoid receptor. And uh, in addition, there were differences in methylation that corresponded to their position within the litter as being either the highest licked or the lowest licked pup within that litter. Um, so in this sense, increased maternal care, of course, represents a form of environmental enrichment. And we think that this in part programs the epigenome. And we know that maternal care received has lifelong consequences for mitigating the response to stress in mammals, including not just in rodents, but also in humans. So in terms of early life adversity and interventions that might modify these responses, we know that uh, animal studies show that maternal absence leads to, among other things, cold stress and induces behaviors in pups like ultrasonic vocalizations that solicit maternal care. Um, in humans, we know that uh, tactile stimulation in the early life reverses some of the developmental impairments associated with preterm birth. And there's some substantial studies from, for example, Allison Fleming's lab that has shown that tactile stimulation, which is something that occurs in the context of licking and grooming, will uh, also reverse some of the developmental impairments associated with being uh, raised separated from mom. So rat pups are poikilothermic, meaning that they're unable to regulate their body temperature and they respond to variations in ambient temperature by behavior, such as the ultrasonic vocalizations to solicit care and physiological responses in uh, hormone systems like the thyroid hormone in particular. So um, we don't have to go into the details of this, but just to say that again, what we're dealing with is a negative feedback loop here between the brain and uh, the thyroid gland in terms of regulating the production of thyroid hormone, which is critical for met metabolic responses, growth and development, where um, the uh, hypothalamus simulates through an endocrine cascade, the release of uh, thyroid hormone, um, the um, thyroxin and uh, tri idothyroxin, which is the active form of thyroid hormone that then feed back up into the brain in areas like the hypothalamus that uh, regulate the levels of subsequent release of thyroid hormone. And um, so triidothyronine is the active form that inf it influences many processes, in particular the regulation of metabolism, but it also in the brain acts on specific genes. So we know that one of the genes that um, T3 binds to in the hypothalamus is oxytocin, which is critically involved in social signaling. And um, it's known that it does this in a very specific way. So T3 through uh, binding to thyroid hormone receptor binds to a composite hormone element in uh, the oxytocin gene promoter that inhibits oxytocin expression. And so that has consequences potentially for the regulation of behavioral outputs that are mediated by oxytocin. And just to touch on, a, on some of these, in, these include maternal behavior itself, pair bond formation, so a lot of social cognitive behavior, and also has consequences for anxiety behavior. So we did a study where we were interested to look at um, the impact of repeated off-nest temperature exposure during the first week of life in pups. And when this occurs, um, pups are, are uh, they're exposed to a cold stress of room temperature, which is known to drive changes in thyroid hormone. And so we had a condition where we had either maintained the pups at nest temperature after, when being separated daily for the first seven days of life, or we had repeated room temperature exposure, um, or we had a condition where we had a single acute room temperature exposure at seven days. Um, at the end of the, uh, the um, early uh, postnatal period. And half of the animals were supplemented with additional tactile stimulation to simulate maternal care. Um, and so when we did this, we found that um, ambient temperature exposure altered circulating levels of T3, um, such that repeated room temperature exposure 
every day for seven days, reduced levels of circulating T3, whereas acute room temperature increased levels of circulating T3. And we assessed um, oxytocin as a downstream target of thyroid hormone. Um, and um, what we looked at was the con in the context of how DNA methylation uh, differed among animals who received maternal care stimulation and animals who received repeated room temperature exposure. And we found that um, room, repeated room temperature exposure was associated with increased DNA methylation of the thyroid hormone response element in oxytocin and increased binding of thyroid hormone receptor to the uh, composite hormone response element. So in some cases, DNA methylation can also recruit um, the binding of specific transcription factors. And in this case, this, uh, this appears to be the case for this response element. Um, when we saw uh, increase with increased binding of thyroid hormone to uh, the composite response element, we found that that was associated with decreased oxytocin expression in with repeated room temperature exposure. We also found that the stimulated condition where we gave additional tactile stimulation to the pups was associated with reduced oxytocin expression as well. We're not sure why that occurred, but um, one idea is that it could be that the um, uh, stimulation that we're providing was not, uh, was, was in part an aversive stimulation to the pups. So it wasn't exactly mimicking what the kind of stimulation that they were receiving from their moms. But um, in any case, one potential uh, conclusion, one possible explanation of our findings is that there's a repressive effect of the unligated thyroid hormone receptor on oxytocin transcription. So um, in summary, lower levels of maternal care received early in life associated with increased behavioral and endocrine responses to stress in adulthood and repeated off nest temperature. So cold temperature exposure rep represses oxytocin through a thyroid hormone dependent mechanism. Uh, we know that preterm infants has challenges with thermal regulation that are similar in some senses to that, those of the neonatal rat. And um, so to us, these studies suggest that variations in temperature exposure on the human epigenome, um, although limited, would be an important consideration for future research in this area. So I, I want to um, end up uh, talking about some of our other work related to the, uh, the impact of maternal obesity. And um, in this sense, our interest in this area involves understanding maternal obesity as a developmental stressor, because we know that excessive gestational weight gain, uh, we know that maternal obesity, either in the interuterine environment or early in postnatal development, um, primarily through the consumption of diets that are high in saturated fat, are um, a situation where we see the uh, um, we see chronic systemic inflammation, we see chronic elevated glucocorticoids in the maternal environment that also impact the fetal brain, um, and we know that uh, in the context, for example, of uh, metabolic syndrome, which appears before diabetes, it, it, it is a context that is associated with a marked increase in beta, basal levels of uh, court. And so we were interested in understanding the impact of maternal obesity as a stressor in offspring and um, how uh, these modifications might impact the epigenome in a manner that per may persist throughout the lifespan. Um, and uh, one other aspect is that there are uh, some studies that have shown that um, the offspring, offspring metabolic responses, but also uh, behavioral responses to stress are modified in a manner that uh, models mood disorders through the um, exposure of, of uh, offspring to inflammation and to glucocorticoids in the inter interuterine and early postnatal environment. Um, so um, before we get to that, I wanted to just mention one study we've done in humans to address the question of how maternal obesity modifies the epigenome. And so in this study, what we were looking at was at birth, um, kids from moms who were obese 
uh, compared to um, normal birth weight moms' kids. And we were interested in understanding uh, whether we could identify sex specific differences in DNA methylation as a function of the maternal obesity context. And so uh, when we looked across the genome using a sequencing based approach, we found evidence for differential methylation in both male and female neonates at birth from mothers with obesity that occurred across all chromosomes, including the sex chromosomes. And this is important because often in these studies, sex chromosome data is just thrown out. And so in the interest of achieving uh, increased power, for example, it's often not considered, the sex of the offspring is often not considered in, in um, studies of uh, epigenome-wide association studies. But when we broke down the differences between offspring, uh, male and female offspring, we found that they were largely sex specific. So many of the genes that are modified at, at birth in offspring from mothers with obesity um, are uh, specific to either whether the male is a male neonate or a female neonate. And there were a few that were in common. Uh, two of them are interesting because these two are interesting, in fact, because they relate to metabolic disease. Uh, one of them is involved in influence, insulin secretion and the emergence of diabetes. And another one is responsive to phytoestrogens in the diet. So these are potential avenues to explore in future. But some of them, specifically uh, several genes within the male neonates, were imprinted genes. And so imprinted genes are genes that are uh, known to be differentially methylated. And um, these, are, these are genes where methylations, methylation is playing a primary role in regulating the expression of those genes. And these, these were among the top differentially methylated genes by neonatal sex. We also found, because this was a sequencing-based approach, we were able to look not just at gene promoters, but across the genome at uh, intergenic regions. And we found, in fact, that most of the changes that we saw associated with maternal obesity were not in gene promoters. In fact, they were either in the gene bodies or in intergenic regions. And this has important potential implications for um, the regulation of genes through epigenetic mechanisms, not just in protein coding genes, but in other kinds of genes. In our animal model of this, we gave mothers a high fat diet, so high saturated fat diet before, during, and after pregnancy. And we saw evidence in their offspring in adulthood of increased anxiety-like behaviors, increased endocrine stress responses, particularly in females, and uh, changes in the expression of glucocorticoids uh, receptors in a manner conducive to potentiated stress responses. This also occurred in neonatal life, where we used different assessments of anxiety behavior, stress responses, and gene expression, but found similar profile, where offspring of, um, showed enhanced stress responses in, uh, in the context of being exposed to a mother uh, with obesity. So when we looked across the genome at differential methylation in this context, we found that there were a number of genes that were differentially methylated in adulthood, and in early life, but there were also a number of genes that showed differential methylation across uh, from early life all the way through to adulthood. And when we contextualize these genes in terms of what kinds of biological pathways they're known to be associated with, we found that the primary types of pathways associated with differential methylation in the context of maternal obesity was uh, in genes involved in neural projections and neural system development but also genes involved in um, other organ development um, and in terms of uh, genes involved in uh, post-translational modifications to genes. And this is in, in, the, brain, uh, in the brains of individuals uh, from early life through adulthood. So we think that um, what we're, uh, the kinds of approaches we're taking here are conducive to a mechanistic understanding of how the maternal dietary environment can act as a stressor that increases behavioral and endocrine stress responses all the way to adulthood, and particularly among females. And we know that um, from these studies that these involve changes in the expression of stress-sensitive genes to adulthood and consistent DNA methylation modifications from early life to adulthood. So I just want to mention one other uh, thing as I pass because I'm very excited to start this work is um, my involvement in uh, a study being conducted by Dr. Uh, Vipa Jonas, who's uh, at the Karolinska.
involving um, immediate parent infant skin to skin um, contact in the context of very premature, um, very preterm birth infants. And so um, in, in, it's in this context that uh, I'm very happy to be involved in this symposium and make uh, con connections with others who uh, are interested in this, in this kind of work. So with that, I'll just thank the people who are involved in uh, doing this work in my lab, in particular, Aya Sasaki uh, and um, uh, Chris, uh, um, Samantha Lobby, who did the work on the um, maternal intervention study looking at uh, oxytocin receptor methylation. Um, and I'll thank all my collaborators, including the McMaster group, who is, who's following the preterm, extreme preterm birth cohort. Um, and uh, some of my, my newer colleagues at the uh, Karolinska. And thank all of you for your attention. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, very clear and inspiring. Uh, I wonder, do we have any questions from... No, not yet. We have... Um... Yes, we have. Um, so there's a question from um, the online audience to Patrick. Uh, so the question is, what would you say is the translation of licking and grooming in a human parent? Yeah, I, I think there's no direct translation to that, but um, we, what we know is that uh, from a couple of contexts that I've described, in terms of the maternal um, contact, the kinds of effects that we see on the stress response with increased maternal contact to mom, uh, that includes increased breastfeeding as well, are very analogous in the rodent context and the human context. And um, also just in terms of uh, the connection between uh, baby and mom in terms of the, uh, the direct contact uh, that occurs, for example, during breastfeeding, there are a lot of parallels there in terms of uh, animal responses and, and responses in humans. And this is something we're interested to actually explore in the human context in this, um, this study of preterm birth at the Karolinska as well. Thank you. Next is a technical question. How did you provide the artificial stimulation in the animal studies? We used a paintbrush. It's very, very technical, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what we're doing is we're using a very soft paintbrush and we're stroking the pup. So we provide 15 minutes of stroking stimulation to simulate the kinds of stimulation that the mother provides to the, to the, uh, the pup. And when she does that, she's providing stimulation to the pup by uh, licking and grooming the pup all over the pup's body, uh, including the anogenital region. And all of this is absolutely known to be critical for neurodevelopment in the, in the, um, in the rodent. And so we're simulating that um, by doing that kind of uh, that kind of manipulation. Great, something to take back to our NICUs, perhaps, or maybe not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can I can I ask you? I think we have had um, a great afternoon here with them, um, and I think we are all very convinced by you and the other speakers here that we're working in the correct direction or. Uh, in the NICUs with, uh, with uh, having babies skin to skin contact, for example. And, but, so I won't ask about that, but I felt that the, the, the thing you just told us at the end here was about the overweight or obese mothers uh, was also really worrying. And uh, because I, in Sweden, and I guess also in, in, uh, in your, on your continent, we have an increase in proportion of obese young women who give birth to children. And I think, uh, in, I think now 28% of, of new mothers are, are overweight, at least they have a BMI above 25 in Sweden. And the, this could have huge implications for, for society. If, they, if, if this connection is strong. So I would like to ask how strong is, is this? Has this been was assessed this, uh, in, in, in humans or is, this, is it animals now? Yes, there's a lot of evidence in humans that um, 
the maternal obese environment. Uh, I mean, some of it I, I pointed to in our recent research on the epigenetic profile, but in terms of um, effects on inflammation and um, the relationship between maternal obesity and poor neurodevelopmental outcomes, there's uh, quite a body of literature that supports that. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that. I mean, one of the factors that's interesting to think about in this context is that of breastfeeding, because that is something that's much more difficult in the context of a, a, an obese woman to do um, for various reasons. Um, but in our animal models as well, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's more difficulty in providing maternal milk um, to pups in, uh, from obese mothers. So uh, we're just beginning to understand those effects, but I think that they occur not just at the level of uh, postnatal care, but also prenatally potentially, which is a little bit harder to potentially mitigate. Because often in the literature as well, what you see is that the focus and emphasis has in childhood obesity has always been on the, the offspring itself and the offspring dietary environment. But uh, some of this research indicates that some of these, that there are also important effects that occur prenatally. Well, thank you. Uh, I think, did you want to say anything, Stina? No, first, or do we have any more questions? I can't see anyone. So with that, I, do, I just wave you this again. Uh, thank you so much for an excellent uh, talk. We enjoyed it very much. And um, with this, I would like to conclude this um, session for this and leave yes. the word to Stina. And yeah. I just wanted to uh, thank Agnes Linear and highlight that she really was very, very important to, to put this program together. It was fantastic. And then the next speaker.